It, welcome everyone to this Open Access Week session on long form publications. I'm Hannah Crago, I'm the Open Research Development Librarian at the University of Essex, and I'll be leading the panel discussion today with the support of Holly Limbert, Repository and Open Access Librarian at the University of Derby. Um, so today we have a fantastic group of panellists here with us who are going to speak about their experiences and perspectives on open access books primarily. Um, so I will let each of our panellists introduce themselves more uh, fully, but just to say we have Dr David Barker, Senior Lecturer in Publishing at the University of Derby, Dr Joe Deville, um, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Organisation, Work and Technology within the Department of Sociology at Lancaster University, and also Managing Director of the Open Book Collective. Professor Jose Prados, Head of the School of Psychology at the University of Derby and Professor Raluca Sarunu, um, Professor of Psychoanalytic Studies within the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytical Studies at the University of Essex. So each of our panellists have different experiences with open access publishing, and um, so we hope to get a really good discussion going today. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to our panellists to introduce themselves a bit more thoroughly and explain some of the reasons why they're here today, as well as the sorts of things they're interested in discussing around um, long form publications um, for open access. So please do feel free to start putting any questions you might have in the Q&A as each of our panellists are speaking. Um, but I'll hand over to the panellists now in turn um, to speak a bit more um, now. So uh, I'm just trying to find the button to stop sharing my screen, um, which has disappeared. But there we go. Um, so first of all, I'll hand over to David to introduce yourself a bit more. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming along. My name is Dr. David Barker. As Hannah said, I am senior lecturer in publishing at the University of Derby. Uh, so I've been lecturing and researching in publishing for seven years. Uh, previous to that, I worked in the publishing industry for 21 years. Uh, in London and then in New York and then back in London, primarily for a academic publisher called Continuum, which was then acquired in 2011 by Bloomsbury as part of Bloomsbury's operation to expand their academic publishing division. Part of my role when I came back to London in 2013 to work at Bloomsbury's headquarters there was to uh, lead, in a sense, their open their experiments with open access book publishing uh, between sort of 2013 and 2016. Uh, so I'm very, very interested in the ways in which both commercial academic publishers and university academic university press academic publishers approach this concept in different ways, some of which overlap. So I'd be happy to talk about anything to do with that. I'm very interested in the differences between open access monograph publishing and open access textbook publishing. Any kind of issues around that uh, are areas that I would love to talk more about today. Thank you. Thanks, David. That's really great. Um, Joe, can we come to you next? Yeah, thanks very much, Hannah, and thanks very much for the invitation to, to contribute to the discussion today. Um, so, yes, uh, I guess I've got many different hats. Um, I became involved in open access book publishing a number of years ago when I and some then early career colleagues uh, founded a very, very small open access uh, book, publisher called, book publisher called Mattering Press. That was around um, uh, 20, 2014 um, and that's still going and publishing books in and around the field of science and technology studies but yeah we're a very very small publisher and then through that um, became involved in a project which some of you may have come across um, which is now finished called COPIM. COPIM stands for Community-Led Open Publication Infrastructures for Monographs. Um, that was a project uh, funded by uh, Research England and the Arcadia Fund and uh, sought to develop a range of workflows, practices, and also crucially um, digital infrastructures and revenue models to that we thought were necessary to potentially start to more concretely build towards a more sustainable and fairer future for open access uh, book publishing. Um, that project is now um, 
the work of that project being carried on uh, under the banner of a new project called Open Book Collective. And we're still using COPIM, we're still talking about the COPIM community, but there's a new project funded by the same uh, two funders, um, sorry, called Open Book Futures, sorry, I should say. Um, and that's running until 2026. And that's similarly trying to um, build uh, the infrastructure that we think are important for this work, as well as workflows and the touching on issues such as archiving and preservation, um, revenue models for university presses, um, experimental publishing uh, pilots, we're doing work around metadata management, um, improving ebook accessibility. And then I'm particularly involved in my work for an organization that we created during the Copen project called Open Book Collective, which is in the process of um, securing new funding for uh, either diamond open access presses, so pure open access presses, or presses that are uh, really deeply committed to open access. Um, Lots that I'm interested in discussing um, around um, what might it mean to start with the presumption of openness for academic books, what role do infrastructures play within that, how should and could universities' relationships to publishing be reconfigured, a whole host of other questions, but I'll um, come to some of those in due course, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Joe. That's a, you do have a lot of different hats. Um, <laughs> I'll hand over to Jose now. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this panel. Um, my expertise and my knowledge are quite limited in terms of uh, open access, open books compared to the rest of the of the panel. My presence here is um, justified because I recently published a chapter in an open access book. Um, it was Introduction to Biological Psychology, uh, sponsored by the University of Sussex. I co-authored uh, this chapter with a colleague from Nottingham, Claire Gibson, and uh, it was an opportunity to uh, use our psychological and biological expertise and the experience of teaching in biological modules for many years uh, to articulate the different perspectives on the placebo effect, uh, its relevance for the design of clinical trials and how it can contribute to the understanding of um, disorders like uh, chronic pain or depression, that kind of things. The publication process was really, really satisfactory, including uh, peer review. So it was solid, it was uh, respectable, and uh, I thought it was a great idea. So I started exploring the possibility that the University of Derby, a good institution, uh, could uh, sponsor, consider the possibility of a sponsor, the publication of that kind of uh, open access books uh, using the expertise of the staff. Um, I contacted uh, Holly Limbert, among many other people, I have to say, and uh, as a consequence of that, uh, here we are. Happy to help with the discussion. Fantastic, thank you. It's really great to get that perspective as well. And finally, Raluca. Um, thank you very much, um, Hannah, and uh, thank you all for, for the invitation. Um, it's good to be here today. Um, and um, I would like to start by saying that I um, lead an interdisciplinary um, five-year project, which is called FreeSci, uh, a team of nine, and that researches the legacies and practices and of free psychoanalytic clinics. Um, so they are creative collectives that offer psychoanalysis for low or, or no fee for those who usually don't have access to it. Um, and as part of this project, we are articulating something that um, that we call mental health commons. But I think there are really important parallels between different kinds of commons and commoning, um, including knowledge commons. So I'm very interested in, in, um, in this parallel. Um, and these new forms of, I guess, open access activism um, that are so, so um, um, interesting. Um, so I myself, I, I'm not an expert in um, open access um, or any aspect of publishing. Um, so I, I guess I'm here to talk about my own experience with, with open access, but also, um, I guess, uh, from the team working with early career um, researchers to, to register the fact that something about publication and open access has intensified a lot for all of us in the research team. Um, and they are registering uh, an important shift um, and we have various fantasies in this group of more open access uh, publication um, and how we can make the fruit of our research more available to our students and to our colleagues. 
um, and I guess to the wi wider public uh, um, in, in our cases as well. Um, so I'm, uh, what I'm interested in talking about is also um, models of publication, um, um, experiments uh, with, with open access. Uh, we are in the co course of organizing um, and finding a home for a book series. Um, um, which we will call important little books, which will be bilingual um, and open access, and hopefully um, also uh, in paperback for a very low fee. So allowing these objects to circulate and to to have, I, I guess, uh, um, an easy life without too many barriers. Um, so I will stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful, and hopefully these kind of conversations can help to I mean it's not a fantasy for you to have all your, those publications open access. So, yeah, thank you all for introducing yourselves and explaining a bit about why you're here and the topics you want to talk about. Um, any questions that anyone has, please do feel free to put into the Q&A. Um, but I can kick things off with a, a quite basic question for you all, I guess. Um, what do you think is the main motivation for researchers or what is the main motivation for you um, to publish your long form publications open access? What What is that main motivator for you um, or for, for researchers that you know of? I'm happy for anyone to go first on that one. Jose? Oh, you're muted. OK, yeah, should I start? I suppose that um, I've been thinking about it, and there are several things that uh, can be uh, can be uh, highlighted. The first one is the individual self-interest. I have published a number of chapters uh, in traditional, traditional non-open access book, and and typically uh, this is done by invitation from the editors, and in many cases the experience is quite disappointing actually. Depending on the nature of the chapter, it can take many hours of uh, hard work just to review, for example, a particular uh, research topic. And you typically do not get uh, any stipend. You're not paid for it. Um, somebody might be getting money out of that, but uh, not the, the, the regular academic. And the university and the sector uh, do not take this type of publication into account. It's not typically draft material. and, and on top of that, it might have limited use for uh, teaching purposes. So in some cases, the books are expensive and only a few academics which are highly specialized with a high interest on that particular topic would be ready to invest in the book. Otherwise, it's only available from the libraries and in some cases there are just limited number of, uh, of books and, and uh, when there is not any version uh, of the book, uh, that means that almost nobody would actually have a look at the, at the, at the book, at the chapter. So you can recommend it to students, but uh, in large courses, uh, as is the case, for example, for psychology courses, expecting students to obtain a copy from the library and use the, the chapter is, in the best of cases, hopeful thinking, uh, to be honest. Um, so on top of that, uh, if you share a PDF of a chapter that has been published under the copyright uh, by a publisher, uh, always raised uh, legal issues, and I never really know what I'm uh, uh, what am I standing in in terms of the legality of that. So, in terms of using it for teaching purposes, the publication of a traditional book or a chapter in a traditional book might have a very limited usage, um, especially when you are not covering the contents for a whole module. Uh, when it is justified for the students to invest in the in the book, if you are simply covering a few lectures. It is not worth spending sixty pounds in a in a book to, to use a, a particular chapter for for a, a a very small part of the exam. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. Really great to hear that the you know the usage of your research is fundamentally the the issue here. And an interesting point there on not knowing what you can really do with your own work if it's published traditionally mm. and open access simplifies all of that. Really helpful. Thank you, um, David. I think you were next with your hand up. Yeah, just a brief thing for me. Um, I, that was really, really interesting, Jose. That was really, uh, I thought you framed it very well there. I was doing some research about this yesterday, um, looking at various university presses and commercial publishers and what they are currently saying about open access books. Um, and there's a very interesting blog post on the Bloomsbury Academic website from 
I forgot her name now, which is terrible, but the woman who is currently in charge of Bloomsbury's open access program. Very interesting blog post, which contains the following quote. Um, this is from Bloomsbury. Open access publication helps reduce inequity in research by providing unrestricted access to knowledge, which is you know, clearly fundamentally true. But what I'm fascinated by in that is the flip side of that, which is basically there you've got an academic a commercial publisher saying, if you flip that on its head, the other kind of publishing that we do, traditional academic publishing, creates inequity in inequity. research by restricting access to knowledge. So both of those things are true. And it's just very, very interesting to me to see commercial academic publishers and university presses trying to do both of these things at the same time. And it's constantly in my mind how how feasible is that within the business models that these that they are they are operating with it. I'll yeah. stop there for now, but just to sort of throw that in there. I think that's a really interesting point. And uh, you imagine if you were publishing something with the traditional route with a publisher, and you said to them, "I want this to be open access," and they said, "We can't do that," and you said you're restricting access to equity of knowledge, or flip that on its on. I don't think they'd take too too well to that. So it's a really interesting point. Thank you. Um, Ralika, did you have your hand up before? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Hannah. I, I actually um, resonate a lot with David's point. It's along the lines of what I was going to, to say about perhaps these um, paradoxes that traverse the, the field of commercial um, publishing, no? and that's um, really creating, I guess, a pretty unique situation where um, the publisher will be paid many times while the author um, will seldom be paid at all. No? So I guess my thinking go, goes along this big question, and, and this is connected to my motivation, um, where we can experiment with um, thinking about the Publication Act um, as involved in the sphere of non-commodity, no? where um, knowledge is a, is a non-commodity, perhaps. Uh, is it is it fine to commodify um, knowledge in in any context and in particular in, in this context? So I uh, um, I think that um, reflecting on these paradoxes um, of of the publishing field can can be a very important thing to do and then connect it to um, I guess what many of um, our colleagues and and Joe Noy is involved in in structuring alternative models um, that get get out of these paradoxical functioning. Thank you. Definitely no, really good point. I think that resonates with some of the discussion we had on Tuesday at the short form publications discussion around kind of rights retention and using that as a way to make sure knowledge is, is shared much more uh, equally, I guess. Um, Joe, did you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. I, I, I kind of wanted to follow on actually what uh, some of what, what Raluca particularly was pointing towards there um, at, in, in recognising some of the paradoxes and ambivalences that surround this kind of question, because obviously why I might publish open access and, you know, I have not published entirely open access, but I, I try to and increasingly try to you can have a secure academic position or relatively secure, I suppose. Um, but when I speak to colleagues, I think you know, we need to recognise that many colleagues are publishing open access because they're they're told to, or because they feel they have to, or because of things around compliance and so on. And you know, some of the reasons why we might really want academics to embrace not just not just do open access because they're you know they're they're told to as part of a kind of ref compliance exercise compliance exercise, but because they actually want to and they might see the benefits. I think there's a long way to go. I think in that respect, and I think embracing what Raluca I think was pointing towards there that. Um, open access, you know, should be about far more than just compliance. It should be about thinking about those inequities, as, as David was pointing to. Um, but also that uh, there are actually, and also as, as Jose was pointing to, there are actually some very instrumental benefits potentially for academics. You know, increased citation rates would be a very kind of instrumental benefit. But I think even more than that, um, my colleague Yannicka Adama and colleagues have, have created this fantastic resource called the Experimental Publishing Compendium that documents all kinds of ways in which you can really experiment with the form of the academic book. And for me, open access publication has that potential to really actually expand our understanding of the academic book. So we're not talking about academic books being open access 
simply you know matching the standards of commercial publishers although they should certainly do that and they and they often do and exceed it but actually that the injunction to do open access should actually prompt us to think about what is the academic book and how can we really embrace the possibilities of the digital you know of the different ways of integrating content and playing with with form uh, alongside some of those instrumental reasons i think we, we need to to emphasize that to avoid getting into that kind of compliance cul-de-sac and um, which i think comes sometimes amongst some academics for understandable reasons can happen when we mention the the term open access certainly in relation to short form but i think that will increasingly happen in relation to long form as well yeah i think that's a really good point and i think that kind of leads on to something i was going to kind of touch upon in that we don't want it, open access long form publications is kind of at a different stage to short form in that i think it's an opportunity for it's less developed so we've got an opportunity for it to go in a different way to the open access movement went for short form publications which very much was built around compliance and I think we want to avoid that happening with long form publications and make it an opportunity. Um, and part of that, I think, is making it as easy as possible for researchers to publish long form publications, open access, which at the moment, I think the open access long form publications movement is going in so many different directions. It's so diverse. There's so many different ways, which is really great in some ways. And there's loads of different fantastic models out there that some of us who work in this area spend quite a lot of time getting our heads around. But I think sometimes for our researchers, it can get a bit overcomplicated. Um, so I don't know if anyone had any reflections on that or maybe what I was kind of specifically going to ask on this is what role do you think universities should be playing in either shaping and developing the publishing landscape for long form publications or helping researchers to navigate the, the kind of landscape? So just think about the universities role I guess in this if anyone has any thoughts on that at all go on go on Joe yeah I guess I do have quite a lot of thoughts about this but um I mean so I think as, as you know Hannah and Holly you know both well know um you know I think one thing is for universities to reconsider the role of the library within within the institution within within an institution um i think sometimes from outside the library the library is seen as a place that buys content uh, and 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 serves that content to to students and to, to researchers whereas actually one of the really nice things about being involved in projects i've been involved with is actually getting much closer to the library and you know being amazed actually by and then sort of inspired by library colleagues and their their advocacy and the way that they're actually doing a huge amount of work to rethink um, the function of the library, the future of the library within the university, and I think that is that would be, be the place to start. There's such a wealth of knowledge, uh, and you know, and incredible work being done within the library, and to actually pay uh, pay a lot more attention to that and listen to their library colleagues who have a lot of thoughts uh, about how things could potentially be done differently. Thank you. It wasn't my intention to get you to praise us all, but, no, but thank you. <laughs> Um, no, I de obviously definitely agree, um, though slightly biased on this issue, perhaps. Um, <laughs> Relika, did you have your hand raised as well? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, do more praise here because uh, when you asked this question, I was thinking about um, when you came to, to visit our team and we had this dedicated discussion on open access. Um, and all the early career researchers who sit with these issues and ask all their questions. So I guess um, the first thing to do would be to pre precisely organize some space of reflection on all these shifts which are ongoing and not to focus, um, as some of you have already suggested, I think, Hannah, you said it as well, not focus just on compliance. So, of course, my grant is formerly ERC, now UKRI, um, so I, I am going to have to be compliant and all the people on the team will have to be compliant with the open access requirement. But in the process of thinking about substantive things in, in the research, for instance, we are dealing with minor figures in a psychoanalysis who were excluded from the canon or not translated from other languages. Um, it would be an epistemic gain to see these books, which we sort of no unearth or take from different places and, and, uh, and languages, and we want them to be available, no? So it's in the spirit of the project to make them available. 
Um, and the fact that we are able more and more to think about that is um, is a plus, but I guess it needs more structural change where in the framework, in our framework in the UK, you know, where we have the REF um, and research is evaluated, I guess having a, a transversal um, constitution of the issue of open access as something that is um, dynamic and, 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 and quite hopeful um, and that can really um, change the way we think about our own research and access. I, I think maybe it has to be something that all the directors of research are aware of, you know, and talk to the, especially the early career researchers as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because even if we can say that libraries are doing a lot of good work around this, we need uh, buy-in from senior academics as well to help get that message around um, about the opportunities out there and the, the the wider benefits than just compliance, which I think is often still the focus um, within universities. Great. Um, David. Oh, hello, just unmuting myself again and then unraising my hand. There's so many little buttons to press at the top, no. aren't there? Um, I just briefly on this, when you're talking about universities, that, that's not, it sounds stupid for me to say it, that universities aren't my area of expertise, but they're not. But I was looking um, last night at uh, the University of Edinburgh, and if you look at the University of Edinburgh's libraries website, they have a really interesting thing where they appear to be encouraging some of their researchers at Edinburgh to use uh, something called Open Monograph Press, which is a platform uh, which I think is based out of Simon Fraser University in Canada. But you know, it, it's almost a sort of all-in-one. I'm hesitant to use the phrase self-publishing, but there are really interesting parallels here. I think between the self-publishing revolution that has happened in commercial publishing and some of the aims in the academic sphere of truly open access publishing, whereby it should be genuinely possible to get your content, your research, your knowledge out there uh, in very affordable, completely affordable ways to promote bibliodiversity and all of that stuff. But you know, clearly that's just one example of something that's happening at that one university. But there are, diff so, as you said, Hannah, there's so many different ways that this can be approached. I think that's part of what, people, what we all struggle with, isn't it? There's just so many different angles you could try. Um, now I've lost my train of thought. But anyway, yeah, but th I thought that was an interesting example there up in Edinburgh. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely agree. There's so many different routes to, to go down, but that's a really good example. Thank you. Um, Jose. My God. Um, yeah. So in response to your question, um, I think that there is a clear gain in reputation, both for the universities and, and publishers that sponsor the publication of uh, open books. Um, how this is made uh, financially viable, I don't know, uh, but it is not for me to develop the business model. I, I suppose that others <laughs> can be better suited to, for that. But I think that uh, making the knowledge developed by the university accessible to the interested parties including the general public and marginalized groups, is part of uh, the mission of our institutions, uh, making sure that uh, our research and expertise is made available to sectors that uh, would otherwise not get access to, to that kind of, uh, of um, valuable uh, assets is, uh, is part of our, um, of our agenda, uh, especially the widening participation agenda, for example. Um, this in terms of the university and uh, the public uh, regard of our institutions. In terms of the students, I think that uh, promoting uh, the publication of uh, open access books might uh, cultivate the sense of pride in the students of the university and uh, also the, the sense of belonging to a community of uh, academics and students that transparently share uh, their uh, knowledge and expertise. Uh, so this also has uh, an educational value that we, we cannot miss, really. I think that's a really interesting perspective. Thank you to think about that kind of education side of this as well, because sometimes we do think about it very much in terms of ref and research and really focusing on that. But universities ultimately are about education and research. So it's really interesting. Thank you. Following on from that, actually, David, you mentioned at the start about this kind of contrast between um, te open textbooks and open kind of monographs. Um, 
is that something you want to expand on a bit? I know when we're looking at publishing uh, books open access, often for textbooks, publishers just say no, textbooks aren't open access. And I can only assume it's because they can make more money from textbook sales. Um, I don't know if you want to say any more about that from your your perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hannah. Just very briefly on that, you're right, textbooks are in, in the academic publishing world a, a very different and, as you say, if you get it right, phenomenally more profitable uh, revenue stream, as we say in, in the publishing industry. Uh, even that phrase is a little bit... Anyway, um, yeah, so but I, I, there are examples of it. I was looking at one just a couple of days ago on the Taylor & Francis Routledge website. They have a fully open access global history textbook that they have made happen um where every single chapter is free to download all of that so it's 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 doable but i think you know the vast majority of conversation around this tends to congregate around monographs or what we now call mini graphs the short versions of monographs that are all over the place um the other thing i would just throw into that mix is certainly when i was working at bloomsbury academic we did quite a lot of experiments with this and it became extremely clear that if you as an academic publisher make a long form academic book available online open access you can still publish print versions of those books and sell them in decent numbers genuinely decent numbers at 15 20 25 pounds whatever so considerably cheaper than a typical hardback monograph which might be 75 80 90 pounds so there's a really interesting thing around that in terms of discoverability and just the fact that the content is out there online some people still want to own a physical copy and i think in a way that feeds back into what reluca was talking about earlier with this concept of can you create a series of little books which are completely free online but also to have you know very 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 affordable print versions for people who want that format because there are still lots of people who want academic content in that format yeah, thank you. I think that's already that's always something that we um, discussions that we've had as well around kind of you can have the open access version online and can still have the print book for sale. It's just interesting to reflect on that side of the conversation, thinking about it on a, uh, kind of textbooks and educational texts with the thought that Radhika said earlier about can we commodify knowledge? Um, it's kind of become acceptable to do that for teaching resources and maybe less so for research. It's interesting kind of reflection on those two those two points there um okay holly did you have any questions that you wanted to ask before i take over by asking i did them? i do have a question i always have a question but um but there are a couple of questions in the q a so oh, sorry, I suppose we, I we should um <laughs> ask yes. those so we have one from catherine um hughes who has a question for jose she says, I was wondering if Jose could tell us more as to why he found publishing an open access chapter more enjoyable. It is sometimes a challenge to make publishing open access the easiest option. So if you could talk a little bit more about your, why the experience was enjoyable for you, maybe as opposed to the traditional side of publishing, academic publishing. Well, now... <laughs> I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, it, it's very straight. Uh, um, when you publish uh, in, a, in an open access book, then you are free to share the link with whoever you want. And it's very straight. I mean, you simply send an email to in the interested parties and that's it. They can get access to the book. If you publish in the traditional book, um, it's not that as, as straight. I mean, you can recommend the book, but then they have to buy it or they have to get access through the library and that kind of thing. And, and you, you never, I'm never sure uh, of whether uh, chapters that I've published in the past in traditional books have been actually read by anybody at all. With open books, uh, you get uh, the impression that you can recommend that to, uh, to the classroom and the students would uh, would get access to the material because it's available and 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 then use it for the for the preparation for the assessment for example so it's it's very very satisfactory in that sense thank you for that um and we have another question uh, from emma booth who says do funders that are mandating open access for long form research need to do more to support non-book processing charge models so that it is more straightforward for researchers and institutions 
to not only be compliant, kind of feeds into what we've already been talking about, I suppose, but to support bibliodiversity and affordable, sustainable open access book publishing, because we all know there are a hell of a lot of models out there that charge a lot of money to publish books open access. So, yeah. Do you think funders should be doing more to support the kind of ecosystem around open access books in terms of kind of how much it costs? Joe. Um, yeah, so I mean, I mean um, just for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm trying to avoid going into too much detail, but um, I'm so the I'm involved in, yeah, managing leading this um, organisation, Open Book Collective, which is one of those organisations that has developed uh, an alternative funding model for supporting open access books and just again because I don't we, you know, some of the audience may not know some of these intricacies so you know the dominant model is the book processing charge model which involves you know payment of a, a fee easily ten thousand pounds you know to a publisher to a large commercial publisher to uh, to allow to, to allow a publication that would otherwise be closed access to become open access and I suppose one of the things that I and my colleagues within the coping project and the open book futures project have been arguing is that that's not a very sustainable model it's not necessarily one that is scalable you know, if you imagine that being replicated across the landscape um it would probably bankrupt <laughs> uh the higher education system certainly in the uk and certainly in other places as well and um, so we've developed an alternative model which involves uh, libraries supporting initiatives uh to, to to help them publish their books open access rather than specific books which is sometimes a bit of a tricky sell for, for universities when they have to, it's not necessarily as directly tied to their researchers and so on. So, so yes, the role of funders in that context is absolutely crucial. And yeah, obviously, you know, I would very much uh, advocate for them um, thinking as, 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 as seriously as they are. And I know that they are, and also within European contexts as well, and, and other contexts. Um, but certainly, yeah, for me, that is one of the key building blocks for a more sustainable uh, open access book publishing future um, and just to return to some of the um, previous discussions about you know, the, fun the function of the university I think it's also connected to how we might think of the function of, of funders and universities as having civic uh, responsibilities and university very much talk about that in relation to the local area which is obviously very very important and widely participation like, equally very very important but some of those civic uh, responsibilities extend the boundaries of the nation state and um, for example when there are global inequities around access and so on um so this is all part of that question i think um, um so yeah the simple answer is yes i very much agree but it, it, yeah i recognize the complexity of it thank you anybody else want to share any thoughts on should the funders be doing more I think, well you could yeah you had your hand up previously um yes thank you um so just to um resonate um, with what uh, Joe has uh, has said and um, uh, to say that indeed uh, in the original uh, grant was which was ERC uh, we had a, um, a sort of dedicated budget for open access but indeed that doesn't solve this problem which I think is as Joe indicates and um, uh, you know is a, a bit of an infrastructural problem so the, the funders need to get involved with the universities and the authors and the more structured, no open access activism to find solutions um, that are more interesting than indeed um, giving this lump sum of money, which then we can pay um, a few monographs or, or, or chapters um, with. Um, and that also um, um, to, to remember my uh, previous uh, thoughts on, 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 on this. Um, in the beginning, I was actually quite um, nervous for my early career researchers um, in terms of how this requirement would impact in, the, in their choice of journals. Um, that uh, psychosocial and psychoanalytic uh, studies is a quite uh, tight field. We have a lot of subscription journals. So I was nervous that their research could all of a sudden not be in these hybrid journals, for instance, where it actually substantively belongs and they need that to, to get an academic job. So I guess there's a lot of um, complexity in this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to pick up on the first point about the funders there and in terms of funders, be the infrastructure not being there to support these kind of alternative models. I think that now the UKRI 
have said that you can use their new fund to support these kind of models. And I'm looking at Joe to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think that they have said that now. But I still don't think it's that clear necessarily how that can be kind of done and whether it needs to, whether you can only support the models where your authors are already publishing um, or not, which I think is is quite the a complicated element of this infrastructure wise that maybe hasn't been anticipated or we haven't seen kind of play out yet what that's going to mean um, in practice. Um, but your second point there, Radhika, about the early career researchers, I remember having that conversation with you um, around your concerns that they need to be publishing in particular journals. And I know we're talking here about long form publications, but I think the same point could be made. Um, we get some academics who want to publish their monographs with particular uh, publishers as well and um, that maybe don't offer open access in the same way. And I think that that is much as we would hope that that isn't a consideration. I think the reality is that it, it is still a consideration that needs kind of a, a broader shift in the publishing landscape for that to not be a concern anymore, um, potentially. Um, David. Uh, oh, hello again. Um, just another point on the, this is such an interesting conversation, is it around funding? I, I think I think the way we need to go, and I suspect a lot of us would share this, is, is more away from this £10,000, you must pay us £10,000 to, to publish your monograph open access towards a much more sort of community driven, global sense of what I guess what is typically now called diamond open access um you know and there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening around that which isn't dominated by the UK and the US which I think has traditionally dominated these these other models of funding which we've been talking about so like you know there's a conference happening in Mexico this week particularly about diamond open access so you know there's a lot of conversations happening in other parts of the world which I think are really promising um and, but I just think this whole concept of the that big block of funding to me has always felt slightly flawed. Um, and I think it stems from a 2016, I think, report that was done by a company in America called Ithaca, where they, they tried to estimate the cost of producing a typical university press monograph. And they said that it was between $15,000 and $30,000 to, to make one monograph in terms of staff costs, editorial costs, whatever. And I remember reading that report when it came out and thinking, I think they've overestimated that. I think, I think these, I'm, I'm being very cynical here. Um, I think that the the typical fee of like ten thousand pounds for Taylor and Francis or Bloomsbury, when you factor in that they are also then selling print copies of those books, I think they're making quite a lot of money out of this. So it's it's a really interesting way that this has ended up being framed, and I think any ways in which we can move away from that that big funding model of ten thousand pounds book processing charge is a very very good way to move. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say on that. I just think that's a great point. Thank you. Um, okay, we have one more question in the chat, Holly. That was from yourself. So. I'll read that one out. Um, so what do the panellists think about the green route to open access and using repositories to share book chapters? Um, so think about kind of self-deposit of book chapters as a way to achieve open access rather than uh, open access with the publisher itself. Um, does anyone have any, any thoughts or experiences on that? I guess, Raluca, that's a way to um, kind of allow um, researchers to still publish with the publishers they want to um, perhaps thinking about your point about early career researchers and who they might want to publish with. Um. Um, yes, I, I think that definitely um, adds a lot and it's an interesting practical um, solution, uh, but I'm, I'm still more attracted to um, what David was saying about uh, just now about this community uh, driven diamond access now in this global sense of we are sharing we're part of this sharedness and does does this solution contribute in the same way um, um i'm i'm not i'm not sure i i would be more interested in these more experimental side of things rather than just uh, providing a practical solution that then you have a bifurcated system 
um, still, and you're still like one leg of this bifurcation still contributes to the old um, system in a, in a sense. Yeah, no, I get what you mean, absolutely fair. Um, any other, Jode, want to come in on that? Just very quickly, I mean, I I sort of feel quite ambivalent about green open access. I think, you know, I think it's 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 in a context where there's we're still in this, you know, um, mixed up sort of situation in some ways. I think it's, you know, it's certainly better than nothing, but I think it does sometimes confuse academics. Um, um, they think that pieces of available open access and but you know but the rights don't really change and you know I've been involved in some publication myself with the, you know, where academics have been really shocked that their copyright is owned by somebody else um even though they've signed you know the agreement you know no one reads the, their agreements and so on and I think sometimes green open access can cause those kinds of um, issues but you know I'm not certainly saying we shouldn't have green open access but um I guess just that it's not it's certainly no no panacea yeah yeah the issues run deeper than green open access can solve, I guess, is what we're getting at. Yeah, I mean, I just thought, you know, in terms of what Jose was saying about making his work open, like if you publish in a traditional book and then you want to share your chapter, a way to do that with a lot of academic mainstream publishers to take a copy of that and put it into the repository, share that with your students, share that with your colleagues. That's a way of making your way at work open by publishing the traditional way. And I think, you know, green open access, I agree, it can it can be nuanced. It is difficult to understand which version, you know, do I own the copyright? What can I make open? And typically there's the kind of the embargo period, you know, but we're kind of, we are moving away from that now with rights retention and all, you know, that kind of way forward. But um, I just think it could be a, a solution. Well, you know, it has been a kind of solution for a long time, hasn't it? People been able to share subscription content via repositories and things like that. But um, I appreciate it's not that straightforward, but just thinking about, yeah, sharing content with students and put it on your reading list, you know, your link to the repository and things like that um, is a good way to make sure people read your work, potentially. Yeah, I guess that goes back to the very first question we had about what motivates you to make your long form publications open access and if it is sharing with your students and more that kind of thing then green open access might be more of a solution um for that um just aware that we've got two more questions in the chat coming so uh jonathan digby said uh there's no new no need to use a publishing house at all no and he said a uh, hosted web space is all that is required um thinking about similarities to the evolution of music recording and publishing business um Anyone want to uh, pick up on on that vision for publishing in the future, David? Yeah, I, I I think that's a very interesting point, isn't it? Um, that to me comes down to the question that I talk about this with our publishing students quite a lot, which is, what is the value that publishers add to an author's work, whether that author is writing commercial fiction or commercial nonfiction or academic scholarship? The only reason it seems to me to be going with any publisher at all at this point is that if they genuinely are adding some kind of value to your work. But if you feel and you've got a team of people around you or whatever that can do whatever editing needs to be done, can do whatever straightforward typesetting design needs to be done and can do whatever dissemination needs to be done in terms of letting people know that that content exists, then I don't think you need to work with a book publishing company at all. Uh, uh, but that's that's one view on it. Again, there are really interesting similarities with self-publishing in commercial genre fiction in particular, whether we want to end up as academics getting into bed with Amazon, which is all of self-publishing is basically run by Amazon. And I don't really want to go down that route, but that's another thought. Yeah. I guess that was a lot of ifs there on if you know this and if you know it, so it's publishers offer a, an easier way around lots of those if situations, I guess, still. OK, thank you for that one. Um, and then one from Emma specifically for you, Joe. Um, so could you speak about COPIM and Open Book Futures role in of supporting open access infrastructure as well as developing different models for funding open access books? So thinking about how important it is that open access books infrastructures remain community led, open and not for profit. Uh, yes, I will. Although I feel like I've spoken a lot, and I don't want to I think I want to give uh, Raluca and Jose a chance as well to, to say anything they want to say. But yeah, absolutely, I think it's really, really crucial. We're seeing so much consolidation within 
publishing uh, industry, uh, the purchase of infrastructures for open access publishing by large commercial publishers. And I think one of the things that we have been arguing is that, yeah, we need the infrastructures of, of, of um, scholarly publication to remain, uh, or not remain, to be controlled uh, where possible by the communities that they serve. Um, and that requires governance models that really secure um, say non-commercial status of organisations and so on um, and it also does require potentially support uh, from, from universities and so on so you absolutely think it's really we, we, we argued a lot that's, that's certainly a really really crucial part of the uh, this uh, yeah that's, that's, I said enough My, the post you. the post that I put in the, the chat also addresses some of these questions Thanks, Joe. Really, really helpful. Um, I'm aware of time and there's one more area I just wanted to cover um, quickly, hopefully. Um, so I'm just thinking we've spoken a lot about kind of our situation where the universities we work out, the environment we have um, around these kind of issues. But I'm just thinking about whether anyone has any thoughts on how the diversity of publishing options for long form publications, maybe how different types of publication options for long form publications how it might affect researchers around the world in different ways. So maybe thinking about um, opportunities for researchers in the global north as opposed to the global south, for example. Um, I guess what I'm really getting at here is that the BPC model, it might open up access for readers, but does it close down access for authors? Um, and maybe the contrast of that model to some of the, the other models that we see really. And if anyone has any uh, reflections on that. Um, yeah, my, my first thought is that um, if we go to academic cultures um, in Latin America, let's say if, if we think about Brazil, um, there most or all journals are not subscription journals. So I guess the learning is opposite here. So um, how can us in, in, in Europe learn from that and see that it's been going on for decades? Uh, you know, and it is a sustainable model. And uh, basically, all you need to do um, is go on Google uh, Scholar and search for the article and download the PDF. Um, and I, I think that's that's interesting. Um, and then also, um, I know that um, in various parts of the world, there are forms of sharing uh, which have emerged. And that's an interesting conversation. I guess we won't have time now uh, to, to discuss it, but um, also not every sharing that is in some sort of uh, breach of copyright can be called piracy, I don't think, uh, because in some cases, um, for instance, um, I know in post-socialist um, countries right after the fall of communism, there were no books. So academics and students had to find a way um, to get get access to those, to those books, you know, so um, um, I, I guess, the, again, we're coming to these issues of um, paradoxes and the pressure that, uh, let's call it, closed access creates um, and that how can we organize some viable ways out, out of those pressures. But yeah, that's only partially engaging your, your question, I'm aware. No, that's really interesting. Thank you. And I think that kind of um, almost links to what Jonathan's question and, and made me think, are we trying to recreate an open access version of the publishing model we've already got, rather than rethinking what open access publishing could bring as a completely new model? We're just trying to, are we just trying to recreate the traditional model because that's what we're all familiar with and that's what we're used to and that's what we think people want to see. But should we be thinking more broadly when we're thinking about open access and what can it help us to do diff completely differently, maybe with the way we're sharing knowledge rather than just redoing an open version of what we already have? Does anyone have any other final questions or thoughts um, that they want to ask to our um panellists or any panellists have anything that you really were hoping to say um, while you were here that you haven't had a chance to that you'd like to add in before we wrap up? No? Okay. Otherwise then, I think we're at time. Holly, shall I, shall I call it to a close? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, thank you 
to all of our panellists today. It's been really helpful to get all of your insights and all of your really different perspectives. It's been really interesting. Um, and thank you to all of the people that have attended today, um, asked questions, contributed your thoughts to the chat. I have been seeing um, the conversation going on there as well. So really interesting to see that as well. Um, we will be sending the recording round of the session um, to everyone that has attended today and those that signed up. Um, but in the meantime, if you do have any questions um, about the session, please do get in contact with myself or Holly. Um, but otherwise, um, we hope you've really enjoyed the session today. I know I definitely have. Um, and we hope to see as many of you as possible um, tomorrow at our final event for International Open Access Week. Otherwise, thank you all very much for coming and it's been great to see you all. Thanks everybody, thank you. Thanks so much to Holly Thank and you. Hannah for organising such a fantastic panel. You're welcome, Thank Joe. You. Thank you so Thank much. That was interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.